Well, everyone loves a good story. Uh, most of us see or hear dozens of stories each day. If you count the books that we read to our youngest children, it may even be hundreds of stories every day. But unlike um, most generations that came before us, we get most of our stories from professional storytellers. And more often than not, they're multimedia productions designed for people with ever shrinking attention spans, and they're designed to fit 30 second slots of time. Needless to say, we modern comparatively amateur storytellers may not be as sharp as the ancient ones. As you've gotten to know me and Kate, uh, you may have sensed a few differences between us. My own mind tends to explore many non-linear tracks of thought. Sometimes I'm on a few tracks at once. Sometimes I forget one of the tracks. Now, if Kate were trying to follow that track, let's just say hypothetically, but I got derailed or just moved on to what was for me a more interesting track, I might leave her hanging. And that's okay because, you know, she'll usually rein me back in with a quizzical look and a question like, uh, wait a second, is that all? When I give her my wounded look, she says, I just felt like I might be missing something, like the end of the story. Now, when I travel to Latin America, I've noticed how good people are at, at telling stories when they have no television or internet around. A few years ago, while I was living with the Guatemala family for a couple of weeks, I made friends with a couple of Brethren Volunteer Service volunteers uh, living in the same village. And Aaron and Becky introduced me to a great way to save face when you realize your story is falling flat. As soon as you can see what's happening, you just throw in with as much shock as you can muster. And then I found $5. Now, it doesn't really help the story, especially once your wife knows the trick, but it can get people laughing and sometimes partially make up for not quite nailing the end of the story. Now I'm getting better at recognizing when people are wondering what a story is leading up to. And if I can be honest, just looking at the screen here, I'm starting to get that sense right now. Well, the answer, as our children learn from every children's story, is Jesus, right? Well, Jesus or God, it's always Jesus or God. In this case, it's Jesus. And our gospel lesson comes from Mark, from Mark's story about Jesus. Mark is a master storyteller, if a bit unconventional. And considering his extraordinary subject matter, this is understandable, if not necessary. To tell the story about Jesus in a conventional way would, miss, would risk missing the mark, missing the essence of who Jesus is and what difference he can make in our lives. So good Jesus storytellers have to be a bit unconventional. If they really want to keep your attention, they have to keep surprising you or at least, at least keep you waiting on tiptoe to find out what happens next. So Mark has set the entry to Jerusalem story up really well. Eleven chapters into his gospel, Mark's hearers are tense with anticipation, anticipating conflict and danger, but also triumph. The structure of Jesus' preparations for that entry leads the first time here of this story to anticipate Jesus' coronation. Jesus has clearly thought this through. He sends disciples out to fetch a colt with words to say if they're challenged. When exactly did he make those arrangements? Is he managing a secret team of assistants? So now Jesus waits to enter occupied Jerusalem until the nation's highest holy festival. It's Passover, and it celebrates the liberation of the Hebrew people from their slavery in Egypt. Now, just for scale, it's a bit like if Americans were to celebrate the 4th of July and Thanksgiving together, right? It's a national holiday, but it's quite a bit more religious than either of those holidays are for us. Okay, just, just think about the scale. At any rate, the Passover event actually came many, many generations before Jesus lived, or many hundreds of years. But it was no stale tradition. In Jesus' day, Passover was as relevant as ever. Once again, in Jesus' day, the Hebrew people are not their own masters. 
They're subjects of Rome. They pay tribute to Rome. They are ruled by Caesar, a pagan blasphemer who proclaims himself the Son of God, the Lord of all, the Savior of the world. This is his own words. We find these on coins. We find these on stone tablets, proclamations. And the Jewish religious leaders keep telling the people to stay quiet and obey Caesar, which is all well and good for the leaders because the Romans reward the leaders with wealth and privilege, but it doesn't serve the common folk who toil each day under Caesar's thumb. So Jerusalem during Passover is a tinderbox of tension. Thousands of Jews from all over Judah swell Jerusalem's population to several times its normal size. Is this what Jesus had been waiting for? Will this be the year that the Hebrew people again overthrow the yoke of their oppressors? No. Even after the city is full, Jesus waits outside the city. He waits for Pilate, the Roman governor, and his Roman legions to enter in full military regalia. Pilate's military, military parade is the traditional mark of a military triumph, the parade of a winner. Pilate and his stallion-mounted commanders and their armored soldiers let any would-be rebels know the government is prepared for violence. Challenge our rule and you will be crushed. It had happened before. One can imagine the silent seething of the crowds watching the parade, hearing officers barking out commands, the clashing of swords, the stamping of boots. Now the moment arrives. Jesus enters from the Mount of Olives. It's the place the Jewish people associated with the military defeat of David, Israel's greatest king. It's also the place from which the ancient prophets foretold Judah's restoration would come. Now, Pilate might not have been registering the meaning of that, but his Jewish subjects did. And Jesus descends into the city with his own large band of disciples, followers, curious onlookers, and the people cry, Hosanna, save us now. Save us, you who come from God. Save us, you who descend from David. In heaven's name, save us. If ever there was a time that Jesus could have credibly called upon his followers to revolt, it would have been right there. They were with him. And then we have verse 11. Then he entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Wah, wah. What an end to a story. And then he found $5, right? Triumphal entry indeed. The story of the triumphal entry is a story of disappointed expectations. It's what happens when someone you admire refuses to be who you think they should be. The people want a hero. They want Jesus to be their Messiah. The Reverend Ayana Johnson Watkins of the Disciples of Christ explains, the poor are suffering under Roman oppression. Even the well-off are also suffering, allowed to succeed and flourish only within the confines of a foreign culture and its values. There is no room to be the chosen people of God that they know they are. They are sure of what kind of change they need, Jesus' entry is almost a triumph. You know, the well-known aphorism is grim, but it's apt. Almost only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. It begs the question, is it good enough? Which begs the question, good enough for what? Who decides what a triumph would be? Who decides whether Jesus achieved it? Judging the nature or quality of Jesus' triumph, I think, would require that we take a step back in Mark's story for a wider view. Consider that Jesus is introduced by John the Baptist, right? This, this uh, zealot-like, revolutionary kind of uh, preacher, hellfire and brimstone preacher in the wilderness. He's introduced by John the Baptist and a voice from heaven 
He announces the kingdom of God. Jesus gathers disciples. And chapters 1 through 10 of Mark show how Jesus carries out ministry in Galilee. Through parables and otherwise, he teaches about the nature of God's reign. His miracles illustrate his teaching and testify to his identity. But there's conflict that's building throughout these chapters. Jesus is changing lives and trying to keep it a secret. He's drawing crowds, but he's rejected by his hometown. He's challenging the culture of religiosity and the tradition of his elders because he's trying to teach a kind of faith that runs deeper than the rules and the traditions. He's making the political leaders nervous and the religious leaders angry, and he's on the way to the capital. And people are pronouncing him the Messiah, and he's telling them he's going to be executed. So Mark wants us to know that Jesus came to change lives and to change the world. And the hearers of the story can sense that even Jesus' closest disciples may be misunderstanding him and his message. Is Jesus' entry into Jerusalem a triumph? We all want to follow a winner, right? But what about the storyteller? What does the storyteller think? All four Gospels tell this story. It's of prime importance to the earliest narratives about Jesus. The listeners to the story have already heard the spoiler. They know the ending that Jesus will be killed, that he'll be raised. And, and once again, Mark's got a strange way of ending the Jesus story. Now, just for a sidebar, if you're not aware, uh, there are different endings in Mark's gospel. Did you know that? You can find them in your own Bibles. If you're looking at Mark, check it out. At the end of, at the end of Mark, you can find the shorter ending and the longer ending. I didn't know that until I was in seminary. You know what I mean? Like, that's doesn't that seem a little crazy? Like, couldn't you just pick? Well, the thing is, we, ha we have manuscripts, ancient, we don't have the original, right? The, the manuscripts that we have are all copies of copies. And we've got different manuscripts with different endings. So there's a longer ending and a shorter ending. But there's also a note there that some of the oldest manuscripts we have end the story at verse 8 with the women going to anoint Jesus' body in the tomb, discovering that it's empty and hearing a strange man in a white robe say, he's been raised. 16, chapter 16, verse 8. So here's the ending, right? Here's this one ending. Okay, so they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The end. The end. That's the end of Mark's, shorter ending of Mark's gospel. Now that is an unconventional way to end a story, right? That would be talked about in Hollywood. That, what a great storyteller, what an unconventional ending. It doesn't exactly tie up all the loose ends. In fact, maybe that's the point. I'm pretty sure if Kate had lived back then, she'd be giving Mark the stink eye and offering that she was pretty sure he was leaving something out. But Mark's hearers are wondering about much more than whether Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was a triumph. They're wondering what it means to be a follower of a Lord who was crucified. So here we get to the crux. Mark's story proclaims Jesus' good news to a people who are still loving, living under the thumb of an emperor. Jesus is a holy man. He's a teacher, he's a healer, he's a sage, and he inherits a religious reform movement that sought to change people's lives. And he's a jester who finds the cleverest ways to stage bold and subversively provocative public street theater to challenge people's expectations. Now here, let's take another sidebar because some of you saw in my bulletin a couple of photos of Palestine. And there's just a little historical note that I put in between those two photos of this strange land formation. I, you know, I didn't even learn about this in seminary. I, it was only after seminary. In fact, I had heard about it, but it, it didn't even leave me with the same impression until I went and saw it actually with my own eyes. 
Now to think about this, because I mean, I'd heard about this again, but to realize how close this is to Jerusalem, and it's only, I mean, uh, just over seven miles from Jerusalem, and just uh, just about uh, three miles from Bethlehem. So just over seven miles south of Jerusalem stands Herodian, and it's an artificial mountain, which Judea's King Herod, remember King Herod, right? Remember, remember King Herod, who was, uh, who was, who was trying to find where the baby Jesus was and had all the innocents massacred. Anyway, uh, King Herod ordered this mountain to be built as a fortress, a palace, and a burial place. And this was just in the generation before Jesus lived, right? So this is well-known and visibly prominent. When you look at it from afar, it, it almost looks like a small mountain with the top shaved off, almost like a small volcanic cone. And the fortress had crumbled uh, has crumbled long ago and no tower stands at its top but it but it, it had a very militarily commanding presence in Jesus day when you're up close it's massive all the more so because you've learned from the locals or or your tour guide that the mountain was built by hand so when Jesus in the last week of his life shortly after turning over the tables in the temple right like casting out the money changers and the people, we don't need to get in the weeds about all the, the sacrifices and the way people were buying and selling sacrifices, trying to convince you, oh yeah, if you want to get in right with God, it's like the sale of indulgences, essentially. Like if you want to get right with God, you know, give us the money, buy, you want to buy a better sacrifice. And Jesus is like, that is not what faith is about. That is not what the temple is about. You're, you're desecrating, you're blaspheming what this place is. So he just goes off. Right. Unfortunately, a lot of people use this as, as uh, a way to justify violence, which is the last thing that it is. And yet, Jesus did go off. Um, but, but more than that, he was provoking the crowds. He was, he was being subversive. He was getting Pilate's attention. Now, in the last week of his life, just shortly after doing this, right, he says to the crowds, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will be done for you. Everyone who heard him would have recalled the command that set the masses of people in motion to create Herodian. And they would have grasped the subversive nuance of his claim. So that's just one example of Jesus' jester subversiveness. Later in the chapter, he'll go on to storm the temple, uh, right, turn over the tables, liken, uh, and liken by story the religious leaders to murderous thieves. Very provocative. By, by few standards, would Jesus' entry in Jerusalem be considered a triumph? He got the crowds on their feet. He poked his finger in the eye of Pilate and the high Jewish council. He got people to pay attention, and he gets himself killed. And not for trying to save people's souls. He's given a public execution for sedition, for challenging the established political order. I believe that Jesus' triumphal entry is meant to point us toward the larger meaning of Jesus' life. And maybe for each of the gospel writers, the true test of Jesus' accomplishment is how we respond. Do we, like the crowd, swoon for a hero Messiah who solves our problems for us? Or when we don't see that Jesus has already solved all of our problems, we say, oh, well, he's just waiting. He's just biding his time. They, someday he'll solve all our problems, right? Or do we, like the disciples, imagine that we're just on the verge of Jesus going big time, mainstream, taking charge of the establishment, only to run and hide when it all crashes down? Or have we grasped the secret wisdom that Jesus reveals in Mark's gospel? God's reign is within us and all around us. God's kingdom conquers with love. It rules with love. It suffers for love. It changes hearts for love. Mark's hearers are wondering what it means to be a follower of the Lord who is crucified. This week, the powers that oppose God will reveal themselves. They'll be revealed in those who trust the power of the empire for their peace and security. They'll be revealed in those who employ fear to divide and conquer. They'll be revealed in those who continue to persecute Jesus today. 
and they'll be revealed by those who courageously suffer indignity and violence without returning it. They'll be revealed by those who stand up and speak for the least, the last, and the lost. They'll be revealed by those who keep the main thing the main thing. That God loves all of us and means for us all to be whole. And the risen Christ needs his church to continue his healing and saving work for all of God's children. Where we respond to this call in faith, love's realm is fulfilled, not almost, but in full. And that is a triumphal entry, indeed. Amen.